Hello, I'm Jessica Brugman. I am a member of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church and so pleased to be able to uh, share this presentation with you today. Um, gun violence is such a, a huge problem for our society today. Um, and today I want to give you a public health perspective on gun violence. Um, but I want to tell you two things before we get started. First, um, I'm not an expert on, on gun violence. And then number two, I'm not going to share any opinions with you today. But before you stop listening, um, let me give you a little bit more context. I am a trained public health professional. So while I'm not an expert specifically on gun violence, um, I have been trained to identify health problems, um, to really look at the research, to really break down and understand what's contributing to those health problems, and then to look at the evidence to see what strategies and what interventions actually work to address those health problems and improve outcomes. So that's the lens I want to put on gun violence for you today. The three questions that I'm going to focus on answering in today's presentation, number one, are what is the impact of gun violence on health? Number two, what factors increase or decrease the risk for gun violence occurring? And then the third question, what interventions and strategies can prevent or reduce gun violence? Again, looking to research and evidence to really answer those questions. So what is public health? Let's just start with the basic definition since that's the lens we're going to be using today to really think about um, and explore gun violence. So public health, and this is a definition from the American Public Health Association, um, it really focuses on promoting health and wellness. Um, and it looks at populations, not just individuals, but it uses data to really look at population health and what can drive population health and wellness. So really just kind of looking at this definition, public health promotes and protects the health of people and the communities where they live, learn, work, and play. While a doctor treats people who are sick, those of us working in public health try to prevent people from getting sick or injured in the first place. So again, using that public health lens, before we really dive into gun violence, let's think about other public health issues that have been addressed in our country over the past several decades. Really, public health as a field started early on, early 1900s, um, when the U.S. Public Health Service was established. And the, the purpose of it was to really address health issues that were impacting our society at the time, our nation at the time. Um, and early on, um, the focus was on contagious disease, like polio, like the, this poster that you see here. Um, but there are many other public health issues that we're all pretty familiar with um, that have been addressed over the years. Things like smoking cessation, automobile safety. These are all vaccines. These are all public health issues. And I paint this, this picture um, for you to really just say, you know, there are many complex issues that we have faced as a nation, you know, in terms of our health. Um, and we've been able to address them. That's through research. Um, through testing, you know, what works and what's driving, driving these health problems. Just because a health issue is complex, it doesn't mean that we can't address it. The key to understanding what to do is to really look at the evidence. Um, unfortunately, there is some research that we can use to guide us to really understand gun violence and what we, what we can do about it. So, I just, again, before we dive into gun violence, I do want to... Um, you know, point out that um, injury prevention, I brought up motor vehicle accidents, I mean, that was something that affected our um, nation, still does certainly, but to a tremendous effect, there was an is you know, much greater issue with people dying in motor vehicle accidents. Um, and a threat of research and injury prevention that was federally funded really helped us to address that. Um, by really changing the design of roads, by enforcing, creating and enforcing policies that lead to, you know, safer um, vehicles. Um, so I think this quote is just really powerful that shows again the opportunity that we have as a community, as a nation, to address gun violence. Injury prevention research can have real and lasting effects. Um, over the last 20 years, the number of Americans dying in motor vehicle crashes has decreased 31%. I mean, that's pretty significant. Death from fires and drowning, another important public health um, injury issue. 
um, that's reduced even more by 38% and 52% respectively. This progress was achieved without banning automobiles, swimming pools, or matches. Instead, it came from translating research into effective interventions. So there are opportunities to do things um, that are not polarizing, that, are, that really sort of look at the, the root of these public health issues um, and creating kind of a multi-pronged approach to address them. So how is gun violence a public health issue? I mean, how does it really, I mean, we know it impacts people who die from gun violence, certainly. We know it leads to premature death. Almost 40,000 people die in the U.S. every year. If you break that down further, 60% of that is suicide and about 36, um, almost 37% is homicide. Um, that about, it translates to about 100 people in the U.S. a day who die from, from gun violence. But we know it impacts more than the individuals who are, you know, who are killed by gun violence. It impacts health of individuals, um, families, and communities. It has snowball effects, so it impacts the people who are left behind, who have witnessed the gun violence, or who have lost people due to gun violence, um, people who are incarcerated, injur injured, um, families who struggle financially because someone has, has died or is incarcerated due to gun violence. So it really does have uh, tremendous snowball effects. There are economic costs, not just for those individuals and families, but really to us overall as a society. Firearm injuries account for approximately $230 billion annually when you really look at um, costs in health care, criminal justice, loss of income, as I mentioned, suffering, and diminished quality of life. And just to put that in perspective, that amount of money annually is more than the cost of obesity and approximately same as the cost for annual Medicaid costs in our country. So I think that really shows the tremendous impact that, that it has. And another key is gun violence is actually preventable, um, and research shows that. Violence is a behavior that is learned, um, and it can be unlearned or not learned in the first place. It is preventable, and I'll talk about what the research says about some of the, some of the ways that it can be prevented. So I love this quote. Again, I hope I've answered the question, is gun violence a, a public health issue based on this data? I certainly believe it is. But I love this quote by former Surgeon, um, Surgeon General excuse me, David Satcher. He said, if it isn't a health problem, why are all these people dying from it? Um, it's not just a political issue. It is an issue that impacts um, individuals, families, communities, houses of worship. Um, it, has, it has tremendous and lasting uh, effects. So hopefully, again, I've, I've kind of um, showed that, that gun violence is a, a public health problem, so let's break it down further. Um, as a public health professional, what I'm trained to do is, number one, identify the problem. You have to define the problem in order to you know, figure out what are some of the solutions. So in defining the problem today, because there's certainly different ways you could sort of slice and dice and, and think about gun violence, I'm speaking broadly to homicide, suicide, and accidental injury and death. You could certainly you know, tease apart and just look at suicide, and your risk factors and your solutions might look really different. But for today, I'm really going to speak to gun violence broadly. Um, and then the second step I took is to analyze the evidence. So, um, and I'll, I'll share sort of my sources and methods, but I'm really going to answer three questions using that evidence, that published research. I'm going to share data on the impact of gun violence on health, factors that increase or decrease the risk for gun violence, um, and interventions or strategies that have been proven to reduce gun violence. So my sources and methods, again, this is all publicly available. I will share my email at the end of this presentation. You are welcome to email me. I'm happy to give you copies of the slides. Um, you'll see on the slides I'm sharing the data where I have data. There are the sources are listed, and again, these are all publicly available. Um, I utilized a search engine called PubMed, which really is just a catalog of peer-reviewed uh, medical and behavioral journals. Um, peer-reviewed meaning they are looked at by um, unbiased healthcare professionals um, that really make sure the data and the articles coming into the journals are, are sound and valid. Um, and then I did pull some data and statistics from, from government and nonprofit sources. I prioritized uh, sources from within the past five to ten years. 
Um, and again, the purpose of this is just to make sure that I'm really looking at unbiased um, information and data to share with you. One thing I do want to point out before sharing some data with you is that the research is not as robust as it could be, unfortunately. Um, about 20 years ago, government funding, federal funding for um, research into gun violence prevention was pulled. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, but a study back in 1993 was published showing that homes with guns were more likely to have a homicide or a, uh, uh, excuse me, to have a homicide by a family member or intimate partner. And following that publishing of data, um, Congress um, um, issued the Dickey Amendment, which basically restricted and pulled funding from the CDC and NIH for gun violence prevention. So really for the past 20 years, the research that has been done on gun violence prevention has really come from, from private and kind of third party um, organizations. So there is some research, um, but unfortunately federal funding plays a huge role in public health research and so there could be more. Um, interestingly though, yesterday, I was really excited to learn this, um, on, December, on December 16th, Congress, um, agreed to fund 25 million in gun violence prevention research split between the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, and the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. So this is really um, tremendous. And what the bill states, which I think, the, I want to read this quote because it really, um, to me, validates that gun violence is a public health issue. Given violence and suicide have a number of causes, the agreement recommends that the CDC and NIH take a comprehensive approach to studying these underlying causes and evidence-based methods of prevention of injury, including crime for prevention. So that's what the bill states, very exciting. Um, again, just to put it in context, I think the, the 25 million will go a long way and I'm very excited to see the, the data that will come in, in the coming years. But compared to other public health funding, just to give you that context, Motor vehicle accidents kills a similar amount of people um, as gun violence does annually in our country, but receives about 90 million in federal funding. All right, so let's move on to really looking at what the published research says, um, answer our first question, which is what is the impact of gun violence on health? Um, and I'm just gonna share some data with you. Um, some of it I've referred to a little bit. I think I mentioned earlier, on an average day, 100 Americans are killed, are killed with guns. And compared to other countries, Americans are 25 times more likely to be shot and killed with guns um, compared to other developed countries. Um, a few more interesting statistics that really um, point to kind of the big picture um, impact um, and who is impacted. Almost 3,000 children and teens die by gun violence every year, 52 women, um, in, a, in a month are shot by intimate partners. Um, disproportionately, um, black people are affected. Black people are 10 times more likely than white people to die by gun homicide. And then we know that over 50% of mass shootings are related to domestic or family violence. Um, and I believe mass shootings are defined as four or more people. I can't remember if it's three or four but um, there, is, there is a definition for that. And then lastly, one in four deaths in a mass shooting, unfortunately, is a child or teen. And we've certainly seen in the news lately with school shootings that that's you know, one area of where mass shootings are occurring. So now let's, let's pivot and look at you know, the impact of gun violence on the health of individuals and communities. We know people die early from gun violence causes injury and disability. Um, you know, some people may not die, but they may suffer injuries um, and lasting injuries because of gun violence. We know that gun violence leads to mental health disorders, so post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse, depression, and anxiety. Um, we know it erodes commu uh, communities and families. Research shows that in areas where gun violence occurs, there is a decrease in, in public safety, there's decreases in property value, family relationships are strained, and certainly education can be, can be disrupted if, if, um, if teens or youth are incarcerated or are injured um, because of a shooting. And interestingly, gun violence leads to unhealthy behavior, so things like smoking, eating disorders, substance abuse. 
And then lastly, um, and I found this interesting, it was something I was definitely not aware of, is that gun violence um, is, is associated with chronic, uh, uh, increased likelihood of developing chronic disease. So those exposed to gun violence as children are more likely to develop heart disease, almost twice as likely, compared to those who are not exposed to gun violence. Um, people are twice as likely to develop cancer, have a stroke, um, di diabetes. So these are all really interesting and unfortunate long, long-term impacts of gun violence, which I think we don't often, often think about. So that was kind of the, the first question, what's the impact of gun violence on health? I now want to shift to what are the factors that increase or decrease the risk um, for gun violence? Let, it's just breaking down the problem a little bit, comparing it to another health issue, thinking about risk factors, heart disease, right? So heart disease, um, we know from research, risk factors include things like um, unhealthy diet, limited physical activity, genetics. So when you start to break down a problem, you can start to identify what are some targets for change that can actually Im improve the issue. So similar to that heart disease example, I'm just going to break down the research to, to um, share with you what are those risk factors that lead to an increase um, um, in gun violence. And I'm going to talk about two kinds of risk factors. First, I'm going to talk about factors related to individuals. So things inherent to individuals, whether it's their beliefs or behaviors. And then next I'll talk about factors in the environment, outside individuals, that can influence um, their, and increase the risk for, for gun violence. So those factors, let's go through, you know, factors that are inherent to individuals, you know, their beliefs and their behaviors. The first thing is perceived oppression. People feeling unequal, feeling powerless, that is a risk factor for gun violence. A sense of isolation and fear. Um, think about people getting in situations and if they fear for their personal safety, they're more likely to um, engage in an act of violence out of, out of that fear. So, you know, the inability to resolve conflict when situations arise, that can, that can lead to conflict because people are afraid. Substance abuse is something that's been studied quite a bit and has been associated with an increase in gun-related behaviors. And heavy alcohol use specifically is associated with possession of firearms and use of firearm for suicide. Involvement in illegal drug sales um, is associated with being a perpetrator of gun violence. And then I want to talk a moment about mental illness because that's, that's an interesting risk factor. Um, and it has been studied. Um, and it is a weak predictor of violence, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit about why. I think, you know, we see things in the news, and sometimes that can um, impact our perceptions or increase, you know, it may um, inflate, I guess, you know, our perceptions of, you know, uh, mental illness and gun violence. But what the research shows is that the risk for violence and um, for violence and mental illness is actually driven by substance abuse or prior victimization. So in other words, usually when gun violence occurs um, in folks with a mental illness, it's also coupled with substance abuse or, or being a, a, prior, a prior victim. And to put it in perspective, um, research has, researchers have um, quantified it, really broken down the data and look at gun violence that happens in a year in our country um, and what they know based on the data we have is that 96% of gun violence incidents in the U.S., again, in a year, are caused by factors other than mental illness. Um, so I think that's helpful context to, to, to have as you, as you think about what are some of the, the drivers of gun violence. Um, another, um, you know, really well-known risk factor in the research is history of violent behavior. That um, is certainly a risk, fi risk factor for gun violence occurring. All right, so now let's shift and talk about environment. There are certainly factors outside of people, you know, in our environment that have been proven to um, be a risk factor for gun violence. Um, number one, decreased economic conditions in a, in a, in a community. Um, abuse in a home is more likely to lead to gun violence. Specifically, physical violence by parents increases um, a person's risk of being a victim and a perpetrator. Um, using gun violence. Weapon use by intimate partners increases a person's risk of being a victim and a perpetrator. 
and then access to firearms. So just access to firearms in the home increases a risk for completed suicide and being the victim of homicide. And then the last um, interesting risk factor is really about social networks. Um, a social network that includes a victim of gun violence or a perpetrator. So if you know someone that has been impacted by um, gun violence or someone who has committed gun violence, you're at risk for um, you're at risk for gun violence as well. And interestingly, just kind of to expand on that a little bit further, um, you know, you hear things like gun violence is an epidemic. Um, more is almost like a figure figure of speech in a way. Um, but researchers are actually showing that this, you know, is true. They're studying um, gun violence like a disease, like, you know, viruses have been studied. If you think about instead of viruses, um, you know, gun violence, you know, witnessing gun violence, knowing someone who's committed gun violence, um, those beliefs and behaviors actually are contagious. And that's what, what the research shows and they're studying it that way. They call it social contagion. So that spread of beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors through different you know, social networks is leading to um, more gun violence. Um, there was some research done in Chicago, um, a study of almost 140,000 individuals, and it showed that that concept of social contagion, that, that spread of beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors related to gun violence was responsible for over 63% of gun violence episodes that occurred in almost a 10-year period. Um, they also, the researchers found that victims of gun violence were shot on average of 125 days after their infector, which is the person responsible for exposing them um, to the gun violence. So again, very interesting um, you know, concept that's being studied um, you know, from a public health perspective. Now let's, you know, we've talked about kind of the negative risk factors or the risk factors that lead to more gun violence. Let's talk about some of the protective or resilience factors. Um, again, just like if we think about heart disease using that example, there are some negative risk factors, but there are things that can buffer you from heart disease. So, you know, being engaged in physical activity, taking medication, um, things like that. Similar to heart disease, the researchers have discovered some of these factors that buffer, um, you know, gun violence and, and reduce it. So from an individual perspective, things like having good physical and mental health are important and reduce or act as a buffer to gun violence. Emotional, emotional competence um, is another one. And then positive attachments and relationships. Those, you know, relationships and networks um, really act as a buffer. Um, to, to, um, to, gun, to gun violence. And then thinking about the environment, um, economic and social capital, um, meaningful opportunities to participate, you know, um, artistic and creative opportunities, especially for kids, where they're, they're engaged in like a meaningful activity and it's building their confidence. Rac relationships across groups, so across um, races, across ethnicity, across ethnicities, excuse me, um, those relationships actually um, served as, as a buffer against gun violence. And then positive media and marketing um, can certainly act as, as a buffer. I think it's easy to kind of get focused on the negative, but hearing about the positive, hearing about good things happen, happening in a community, with individuals in a community, certainly that acts as, as a buffer um, to gun violence. So now that we've really um, looked at what are the risk factors um, for gun violence, I now want to use, look at the research to, to answer the question of what do we do about it? Um, that's what's really most important. What can we do about it as individuals, as houses of worship, as a community? What can we really do to impact gun violence? Um, so I'll talk about some of the different strategies and programs um, that have been studied in the research and shown to be effective. I do want to point out, um, and I'm just going to focus on kind of one part today um, as, as we kind of wrap up. The evidence-based interventions, if you think about gun violence, they can happen, um, interventions actually prevent it in the first place, which is where I'm going to focus, you know, to address those risk factors and those protective buffering factors I just spoke about. 
But there's also evidence-based interventions in the published research that really, you know, what I would call in the thick interventions. Intervent interventions like with the um, law enforcement community, um, you know, working directly with um, the community, you know, in, in the midst of gun violence. And there's also evidence-based approaches for, you know, when gun violence incurs and kind of the aftermath of that. So I just wanted you to know these do exist, but where I'm going to focus on in the rest of our time is to really look at what are those strategies that help prevent gun violence and reduce those, those risk factors that I've, that I've gone through. And there's five different areas that I'll, I'll speak um, about each one of them briefly. Education and skill building, community focused efforts, firearm safety, legislation, and then you know, youth centered um, programs and development. So let's start with youth-focused youth, youth focused support and development. Um, and I get excited when I see some of these examples because I know here at St. Andrews, um, there are many, and I'm aware of many um, organizations and nonprofits in the community that are addressing some of these, these very um, risk factors that are, that are so critical to preventing gun violence. So um, programs that um, provide support for abused or neglected children have been proven to reduce gun violence. Programs that help prevent school dropout, um, mentoring programs for at-risk at -risk youth, um, youth social faith-based in initiatives, which I think gets back to those relationships that I talked about that are so um, important, relationships across, you know, across faith, across, you know, um, communities, across ethnicities. Um, youth leadership initiatives, so kind of building that emotional confidence and that confidence that um, that, that you so need to feel good about themselves. Um, School-based violence prevention programs have been proven to be effective. And then quality after-school programming. So again, I'm sure there are many quality after-school programs in our area, and their goal is not to reduce gun violence, but hey, the, existent, the existence of, uh, th that they have um, is actually helping with that. Let's talk about now education and skill building. Um, so educational opportunities, especially around job training, again, I think getting back to that confidence and that emotional um, competence, people feeling good about themselves, having skills, parenting skills and conflict re resolution. I'm a parent. I know conflicts happen all the time, <laughs> not just in parenting, but it can be stressful. And, you know, when you don't have um, adequate conflict resolution as an adult, as a parent, um, as, you know, w with people you come across, those are the types of situations um, that can occur where conflict can happen. It's not resolved in an appropriate way, um, leading to gun violence. Um, people in schools and workplaces that are trained to um, identify at-risk individuals. So again, um, places where people you know, um, interact with others, that can be an opportunity for seeing people who are at risk, who may need mental health services or some type of support. Um, and, and knowing, you know, call it um, mental health first aid, but essentially just knowing, you know, mental health community resources and directing people to that is, is a way to um, help reduce, reduce gun violence. And education around safe gun storage, that's been studied quite a bit and it actually does, um, it has proven to, to be an effective, um, you know, in reducing gun violence. Community-focused efforts. Um, so I mentioned media earlier, um, but you know, positive media, especially on youth behaviors um, in, in a community, can have a real positive impact. Community cleanup efforts, patronizing local businesses because we know social and economic capital, um, as I mentioned earlier, is a you know is a um, risk factor for gun violence. Community-wide recreation activities. Um, sports, music, art programs, and adequate playgrounds. And I think this just gets back to youth having meaningful ways to apply themselves, not just in their homes and schools, but out in the community. Um, and then access to mental health treatment is certainly, um, in the community, is certainly a, um, a, um, a, a, a shown to impact or reduce gun violence. Firearm safety, so actually counseling on, on gun safety, people really just receiving education. It actually leads to people storing um, firearms properly, 
Um, and there are four specific gun storage practices that have, there's a lot of strong evidence here pointing to um, reducing suicide attempts and reducing unintentional injuries, especially in, in children. Those four um, practices are keeping a gun locked, unloaded, storing ammunition locked, and then keeping ammunition in a separate location. And then legislation, kind of the last area I want to speak to. Um, this could be, a, you know, a controversial or polarizing, you know, topic, but there's actually been research to show what works and what doesn't work from a policy perspective. And there's actually a lot of common ground, believe it or not, um, between gun owners and non-gun owners, and I'll, I'll speak to some research around that as well. So in terms of legislation, um, I'll just go through a few examples. A systematic review that really looked at 34 different studies um, showed that states with stronger firearm laws were associated with reduced firearm homicides, um, and the strongest evidence were for um, laws around uni universal or strengthening background checks and requiring permit to purchase. So those two specific policies um, led to the greatest reduction in, in firearm homicides. A national study, a different study, um, examining state-level policies showed that waiting periods actually reduced homicides by 17 percent. Um, and then this is relatively recent. The RAND Corporation, which is a nonprofit group that does a lot of research um, in our country to really help inform um, policy and legislation, they determined um, through their research that child access prevention laws reduced self-inflicted and unintentional firearm injury in children and youth. So those child access prevention laws are, are effective. Um, and then on the flip side, we know that from research that weaker state gun laws um, are associated with increased rates of suicide and increase in fatal police shootings. And then there is, you know, quite a bit of legislation around, you know, aimed at high-risk groups that is, has been shown to be effective as well. So, for example, looking at domestic violence offenders and targeting those individuals. And, you know, despite, again, the kind of the polarizing, um, you know, uh, perspective and, and discourse that's happening in our country on the topic of firearm legislation, some researchers out of Johns Hopkins conducted a study, it was a, you know, using a random sample, a telephone-based survey, and they got a sample of over 2,000 gun owners and non-gun gun owners, and they asked them about their perspectives on 24 different um, gun policies to get their opinions of whether they would support it or they not. And then they compared the differences on all those policies between gun owners and non-gun owners to see you know, how far apart are we? Are there areas of common ground or are there really, you know, is there really, um, you know, a big um, gap in, in what people are willing to support? Um, and what they found is that there was really high public su support for a number of those areas. Um, universal background checks, almost 90% of people um, were, were in agreement on that. Again, looking at gun owners and non-gun owners. Um, there was high support for greater accountability for gun dealers unable to account for missing guns and also um, higher safety training requirements for concealed carry permit holders. A number of these policies um, where people, there was just not a whole lot of um, um, uncommon ground, if you will, on, on these topics. And I think it's just important to really um, not be discouraged um, or, or swayed by a lot of necessarily what you see um, in the media. The research shows there's common ground um, and po perhaps some of these policies um, can be put, in, put into place since people are in support of them. So, you know, some of the research that I looked at had some suggestions for faith-based organizations. I mean, researchers know that faith-based organizations, I mean, we are communities in and of ourselves. We have diverse um, congregations that, um, that, you know, spread out into our communities. I mean, we're in an ideal position to have an impact on these risk factors that I've talked about for gun violence. Um, so just some examples um, that researchers pointed to were things like spiritual consultation, consultation which many houses of worship do, um, to families who've lost loved ones, collaboration with other community organizations to reduce youth violence specifically, 
um, prayer vigils, which unfortunately we see happening quite a bit in our community because there's a need for it. Opening church in the evenings for youth activities, just having places for youth to go to engage in meaningful, um, in, in meaningful ways, building those relationships that you know that I've that I've um, been speaking to as risk factors. And then lastly, just facilitating congregations to become agents for change in their communities, whatever that means for your congregation or house of worship, which, whatever change you're looking for. Um, I hope that the data that I've shared with you today helps you as an individual or as a congregation to decide, you know, what is it that you want to change? What type of change agent do you want to be? Um, because there is good data for us to um, work from to decide you know, and know how we can have an impact. So thank you so much for, um, for listening to this presentation. I do want to share um, my email address. It's Brueggemanns, B-R-U-E-G-G-E-M-A-N-S at gmail.com. I'm happy to share my slides with you, which have all the references. Um, and again, thank you for your time and your attention. Have a great day.